It's amazing to see what a hot meal can do for the soul when you've lost everything and you have not had a hot meal in days. Hi, my name is David Marks and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Operation Barbecue Relief. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit charity founded in May 2011 during the Joplin tornado disaster. We provide compassion, offer hope, and friendship to those whose lives have been affected by disasters across the United States. We leverage our God-given talents and expertise in competitive barbecue cooking as well as catering barbecue meals with our ability to quickly mobilize our teams into any area where disaster disrupts and tears apart the lives of Americans. Operation Barbecue Relief has provided over a million meals and spent 178 days deployed in disasters in 19 states. The thing that people think we all have in common is barbecue, and on the surface that is true. We provide hot barbecue meals to those in need and first responders. It's amazing to see what a hot meal can do for the soul when you've lost everything and you have not had a hot meal in days. Barbecue is comfort food. It reminds people of better times, friends, and family. The sustenance of that hot meal combined with the memories of better times give people hope and the ability to begin the healing process. Once you have worked in a deployment like our volunteers have, you learn that barbecue is the lever that binds us. However, the feeling you get providing someone in need that you will never know, who can never repay you, is the fuel that drives the volunteers of this organization. We are Operation Barbecue Relief. Matt Claussen, a volunteer with the Building Bridges Coalition, previously served as the president. His daytime job is vice president at Partners of the Americas. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. The Building Bridges Coalition recently observed its 10th anniversary with a forum titled International Volunteer Service and the 2030 Development Agenda. Can you tell us more about that? Sure, sure. Um, we had the pleasure of convening at the Brookings Inst Institute to celebrate the Building Bridges Coalition's uh, 10th anniversary. We actually started after uh, an important um, initiative at the Brookings Institution in terms of analyzing and, uh, the, the breadth and depth of international volunteering and service. And there were a, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution began to help convene organizations like Partners of the Americas, Peace Corps, so many other organizations that have been engaged in cross-border volunteering to get a sense just at, at how big the field was and how, how, how much it had grown over time. And from that point on, the Building Bridges Coalition was born as a spin-off from that project uh, with the goal of um, enhancing the, uh, the, the quantity, quality, and positive impact of international volunteering. And it was at this event at Brookings this year that on the 10th anniversary of the BBC uh, that we all gathered as a, as a field, as a big tent of the coalition to focus on um, some of the pressing global needs that we're all uh, that we're all engaged with in terms of the sustainable development goals and how we can further collaborate towards um, these global challenges together. Okay, and what goals did the BBC achieve during this um, these panel sessions? Well, we always kind of view ourselves as a, a lean and mean coalition. Um, we don't have uh, a, you know a staff, but we are a convener of the many different non nonprofit. NGOs, government agencies, businesses that are involved in leveraging the power of voluntary service to, to impact the communities of our, of our planet. And so we were able to bring together um, at Brookings a wide variety of stakeholders to talk about what they're doing from business leaders to um, uh, coalitions of, of NGOs that are focused on uh, helping uh, impact important foreign, foreign investment in terms of uh, development aid through leveraging the power of volunteers um, to, um, to discussing what, what with the UN's sustainable development goals, um, aiming towards reaching a wide variety of sustainable development goals by 2030, uh, what is it that we can do as a coalition of organizations and volunteers together. Good morning, everyone. It's been a great morning already with uh, wonderful remarks from that last panel. So here to illuminate our thinking and our policy making, to give EJ a break from the crazy presidential campaign, 
uh, as we move into what we hope will be a, a hopeful new period uh, in the next administration, our three outstanding panelists. The first, E.J. Dion, is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a beloved columnist at the Washington Post, uh, a longstanding proponent in print and speech for national and international service, author of yet another impressive book, Our Divided Political Heart, which I hope you all will read or have read already. There could be no stronger advocate for national and international service than E.J. Dion. Second, uh, Vanessa Carey uh, is an American physician and healthcare administrator who has used her extraordinary medical talents throughout the world in places like Rwanda and Haiti and other countries in great need, and is co-founder and CEO of an extraordinary nonprofit she will tell you about called Seed Global Health. And finally, Scott Beal, a dear friend who's just an extraordinary social entrepreneur who started three nonprofit organizations, including the inspirational Atlas Core. But I, before I begin, I just want to join you in saluting Harris Wapen. I actually want to salute Harris Wapen and you, because this is a cause that, while occasionally it's come under partisan attack and there have been arguments about quotes paid volunteerism, each of you has done more to keep this. Uh, as a cause that people in both parties can uh, think about and be serious about. Uh, um, um, what better signal about what kind of country we are uh, than to send people all over the globe to serve uh, in uh, communities uh, that uh, both want uh, our help and want to sort of uh, get together with us to solve problems. So that's Practical reason number one. Practical reason number two, and I think it, it, this is being covered in the course of this discussion today, um, uh, precisely at a time of economic trouble when people um, need, um, need opportunities, I think service, particularly for young people who are having trouble gaining a foothold on the first couple of steps of the ladder of mobility, uh, there's a lot of evidence that service is connected with opportunities for mobility later in life. Third, um, the very fact that we are so divided as a nation, uh, we know, if only in the case of some of us from all those World War II movies, how much the notion of shared service brought us together and um, made us look differently at the differences uh, between us. In all those foxhole mm -hmm. moments in those movies, it was all of us together yeah. serving the country. So we need uh, to do that. But lastly, we do still need to be pulled out of this morass of um, mistrust that no matter how bad we are, no matter how much economic difficulty we have, um, we know we are better as individuals and as a people um, when we dedicate ourselves uh, to serving others. Wonderful, E.J. Thank you so much. You know, Vanessa, before you came, General Crystal talked about um, service becoming a habit and something that would be deep in our culture. To EJ's point, in an era of low social and institutional trust, imagine the power of bringing people of different races, ethnicities, income levels, uh, backgrounds, geographies around the world together in common purpose and what that could mean for our country and our globe, particularly now. Uh, about four years ago, I started a nonprofit called Seed Global Health. I'm a physician by training, and through my experience working abroad in Rwanda, Uganda, Ghana, some other countries, I kept seeing people fly in, deliver care, and leave. And all that energy and all that effort would just get dissipated over time. What was not happening was empowering these countries to be able to be self-sufficient, self-sustaining, to take care of, of themselves, which is actually what they want. They want to be able to do that. And so what we've done with Seed is what we're trying to basically tell people and explain to people and fight for is this idea that we can fundamentally change how healthcare is delivered in the world. And the way we do it is by training healthcare providers. The fundamental problem is that today there is a shortage of 7.2 million doctors, nurses, and midwives globally, but by 2035, that problem is about to get a whole lot bigger. It's expected to go to about 18 million by 2035. That is a very short amount of time for a very big gap in the number of healthcare providers. One woman dies every hour from a complication of pregnancy or childbirth in Tanzania. If you look at Ebola, the mortality rate of Ebola is about 12%, actually, if you put them in a healthcare system like ours, that's less than the flu, or about comparable to the flu. In Africa, though, it's been 90% traditionally, and once we started to get some resources into West Africa during the Ebola crisis, it dropped down to about 40%. So we know these things are, we know we are capable of creating this kind of change. 
But the model is that if we can train, let's say we train, one of my doctors trains 10 doctors, and those each go on to train 10 more, and then they each go on to train 10 more, suddenly we have this huge leveraging effect. So I think what we've learned from Steve, just to sort of wrap up, I mean, with the three lessons that I think are the three opportunities in our career that we've learned is one, there has got to be mechanisms to support service. I mean, people say that it should be volunteerism. I've got news for you. Earning barely any money in order to engage in service, live in some of the hardest conditions, and to be able to really have the stomach to see the suffering that you're often seeing in the suffering is service. And to, to sacrifice time with your family is service, but we have to have a mechanism for loan repayment or debt repayment. Seed is going to offset $1.3 million worth of debt this year alone, bringing our total to about $4.6 million, sorry, $3.6 million since the program started. That's four years. That's a lot of debt. Our volunteers give you a standing ovation, and I talked about it last year. It's a critically important opportunity mm-hmm. for this. It's an, and it's an investment here at home. These are folks we know that are more likely to come home and work with underserved specialties and in underserved areas in this country. Better understanding social determinants of health is an opportunity to invest in our own health system. Each person trained sees 100 patients. It's $7 per patient life that we're affecting. That is a cost of effective of intervention. So the ultimate goal here we have to realize is that the big problems haven't been solved because they're big problems. They're difficult to solve, but they're solvable. And we have to be willing to take that as our approach if we're new managers and go for a long-term vision, maybe make what seems like a bigger investment. But in the end, there's an exit plan. We're already leaving some sites because they've hired the people we trained and we're no longer needed. So there is an opportunity to shift how we're doing this. Scott, I had the privilege, one of the privileges of my life actually was to have an Atlas Core fellow, Maret Baguette from Tigger Square, Cairo, the part of the extraordinary women who led the revolution in Egypt. And then she came and worked at our company and mobilized young people from Anacostia to serve in their community. They brought the bald people back to the nation's capital with other extraordinary things. But Moret was like at the center of this revolution here in D.C. So tell us about this reverse Peace Corps, multilateral, professional corps you started called Atlas Corps, and like Vanessa, and like EJ, uh, what lessons have you learned and what advice would you uh, give us in terms of creating a multi-public-private uh, agenda moving forward? Great. One thing I saw was that the world was flat in the private sector. People from around the world went to great companies like IBM or, or to Microsoft to invent Hotmail and make millions of dollars. The world was flat in the academic sector. People from around the world went to great universities and gained knowledge and went back home. It's even flat in the athletic sector. If you're a good shortstop, you go play for the Yankees. If you're even better, you can play for the Nationals. Yeah. 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 And if you're really good, you play for the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talent crosses borders. And what I saw was that, the only thing I saw was having lived in Bosnia and India and around the world, is everywhere you go, you meet smart, talented, passionate people who want to make the world a better place. Talent in this world is universally distributed. But opportunity is not. So I launched Atlas Core. I left stage permanent with this vision create a global community of the world's best social change leaders. Find the most talented leaders, no matter what passport they were born with, no matter what their religion, their nationality, or their ethnicity. Give them an opportunity to come serve in the United States, to not only learn from U.S. organizations, but also share their perspectives and ideas, and head back home to create this global network. Just a couple weeks ago, our 21st class of fellows arrived. We're now to 500 leaders from 76 countries who have come to serve with great organizations like Civic Enterprises. What we've learned in those last 10 years is that, uh, yes, it's a powerful idea, but it's even a more powerful movement. And that when you have an LGBT leader from China serving at the human rights campaign, living in the same home from a, a um, Pakistani youth leader serving at the Malala Fund, that not only does the Pakistani and the Chinese leader learn from the U.S. organization and we learn from them, but the Pakistani leader learns from the Chinese leader, who learns from the Mexican leader, who learns from the Colombian. Over 200 organizations have received Dallas Core Fellows have benefited from their skills, and those organizations are more likely to partner with each other going forward as well. And that we need that multi-sector approach. We need that multinational approach to be able to affect these global challenges. And it's not just going to be a one-way flow, uh, but a global service can be part of the solution if everyone is part of that answer. The human brain. It's built pyramids, cured diseases, and sent man into space. And yet, it's no bigger than a head of cabbage. 
At its best, there seems to be no problem too big for the human brain to solve, unless that brain is malnourished during development. Then its potential is reduced by as much as 25%. Add the effects of hunger, disease, and a general lack of education, and that brain has been forever stunted, as has its owner. Proving that there is a connection between food, nutrition, health, and IQ is the objective of the St. Lucia Project. Our guest, Bud Philbrook, is a nonprofit entrepreneur, co-founder with his wife of Global Volunteers, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary. It is an honor to have a pioneer in the world of volunteerism. Welcome, Bud. Well, thank you very much. Can you tell us more about the St. Lucia Project? Yeah, the St. Lucia Project is intended to demonstrate that short-term volunteers can have a positive impact on children and, uh, and, and all of their development. It's very interesting. At birth, 87% of a newborn's metabolic energy is going towards its brain development. Even oh, yeah. at a year, it's still 60%. So think about that. Mm -hmm. These are vital times. Those first thousand days between conception and the second birthday, if pregnant women and the children receive sufficient food, nutrition, and protection from disease, can have an enormous impact. And what we intend to do is to demonstrate that those children will actually have higher IQs than their older siblings and cousins. That sounds great. Have you started this initiative, or is there a start date for it in the future? We were invited to St. Lucia in 2011. We are working in cooperation with the Ministries of Education, Health, and Agriculture at the invitation of the Catholic Church in a community in the western part of the country, uh, right on the Caribbean Sea, called Ansleray. Beautiful place, but very poor. The first volunteers, teams of volunteers, were there, uh, started in January of 2012. We've since sent about 300 volunteers. Uh, the first year we spent most of our time building trust and relationships with the local people. Uh, in 2013, we focused on how to actually deliver the services. In 2014, we are focusing our energies on uh, primarily pregnant women and newborns and toddlers. And then in the coming years, you'll follow up with those that same group? Well, we intend to be there for as long as we are continued to be invited. And the indications from the government and the community is that that will be for a long time. Excellent. We, uh, Global Volunteers typically works in communities for decades. So Global Volunteers is celebrating its 30th anniversary. What has been the mission during that time? Our mission is to wage peace and promote justice. We engage average Americans in the process of making this a more peaceful world. And the way that happens is through friendship. So our volunteers work hand in hand with local people. And in that process, they become friends. And friends, typically, when there's disputes, attempt to resolve them nonviolently. And so our view is that the more friends there are in the world, the more peaceful dispute resolution there will be. And we promote justice the same way, because when you have a friend against whom an injustice is being perpetrated, you want to do something about it. Right. So the more friends in the world, the more justice there will be in the world. It sounds like a great mission. What do you see for the future of Global Volunteers? Some years ago, the United Nations identified 12 services that every child needs in order to realize the fullness of their potential. The 12 essential services fall into three categories, eradicating hunger, improving health, and enhancing IQ. Delivering the essential services is the focus for the next several decades at least, trying to ensure that every child on the planet could have all of the services necessary so they could realize the fullness of their potential. We know that if just 2% of all the uh, uh, population of the developed world volunteered for two to three weeks a year, within a generation, every child would receive all the services necessary so that they would get all their IQ points that they were supposed to, and therefore learn what they need to learn to become full and contributing members of society. 
So tell us about a volunteer experience that moved you the most. In St. Lucia, uh, we are working with uh, an organization called the Roving Caregivers. These are women who go literally door to door, um, uh, much like a caseworker would, and help new moms uh, learn how to better care for their children. And, um, and then when our volunteers are in country, they go along with the caseworkers and meet with and uh, work with the mothers and their children. And one evening after uh, the day's work, uh, during the reporting session, one of the volunteers said that one of the women that she had worked with that day, one of the moms, asked her if she would be sure to come back tomorrow. Oh, that's great. Yeah, very, um, um, very meaningful to that volunteer. Absolutely. So if people are interested in this project and in learning more information, how can they contact you? Well, they can go on our website, which is globalvolunteers.org, and all the information is there. They can call us toll-free at 800-487-1074. Uh, all the information would be available to them. Stop. Whatever else you're doing, just stop. This is your invitation to make history. You have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to be, be part, part of, of a group, group of people, people on a mission to accomplish something great. How great? Together, we can help raise the IQ of an entire country. Join us. Join us. Together, we can change the course of an entire country. And if we do, the world is next. The Clinton Global Initiative is about to be suspended, an excellent opportunity for young leaders to meet. Travel Television presents a replay of the CGI meeting in Washington, D.C. The Clinton Global Initiative works to solve social problems worldwide through collaboration with industry leaders and volunteer organizations. Today, its members are in Washington, D.C. Some of you will be painting. Some will be installing handrails for older and disabled residents. Others will be repairing porches, removing fences, cleaning gutters, demolishing the wall. Some of you will be putting together boxes for people a long way away from this neighborhood. Recently, the Clinton Global Initiative University, along with Booz Allen, USO, and Rebuilding Together, brought their efforts to the District of Columbia. Students from George Washington University and many other student volunteers gave their time and talents to helping district residents fix their homes. Chelsea Clinton and the former president attended the ceremony held at Kelly Miller Middle School. Along with D.C. Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, Richard J. Wilhelm of Booz Allen, and over a thousand volunteers from the USO and Rebuilding Together. Students from around the country were selected for their activism and unique approaches to solving housing, hunger, and societal issues around the globe. The university initiative at the Clinton Foundation brings the students together to share their ideas, learn from each other, and experience the opportunity to volunteer in other communities. Through a commitment to action, these student volunteers have come up with ingenious ideas to solve challenges in countries like Haiti. Hello, my name is Monica Powell. I'm an honors student at Rockland Community College in New York, and my commitment to action is titled Best for Haiti, and it deals with a solar-powered water purification system uh, that we will be sending to Haiti, an orphanage there, in order to uh, eliminate, eradicate um, the, the disease that is caused by impure water. Hi, my name is Anisha. I'm from University of California, San Diego. We're supporting Project Rishi, Rural India Social and Health Improvement, Commitment to Action is based in India. We got selected because we're presenting um, Swan and One, which is a disabled orchestra made up of ex-patients from the leprosy colony. We want to support them. We want to raise awareness for them. That's why we got selected to come to CGIU. Tell you a little bit about the people we're going to work with today. Rebuilding Together is a group that works to preserve affordable homeownership and revitalize communities by making free home repairs to people in need. If their houses are in bad shape and they are struggling to pay their bills, they can't afford to repair them. That's one of the things that Rebuilding Together does. If when you're doing that, you make the home more energy efficient, 
you put money directly into their pockets by lowering their utility bills. The USO, which is legendary for going overseas and helping to lift the morale of America's troops, but they do a lot of work with the military, former military, and their families in America. Volunteers focused their efforts in Ward 7 of the district, the importance of which was self-evident. Socioeconomic forces have buffeted residents for years, but today those same forces provide a beacon, a beacon that is leading the Clinton Global Initiative to communities like Ward 7, where their efforts are most needed. What we are doing today is not only helping individual people who are strapped for money and need you, and also as a way of saying the District of Columbia matters. Our national capital is more than the government buildings and more than the elected officials that get to zip out and go home on the weekends. It is a symbol of what we care about and our values. It is right for grassroots service. I want to thank President Clinton for remembering that global Global Initiative, the Clinton Global Initiative, includes the United States and especially the District of Columbia. The Clinton Global Initiative is a collaboration. Booz Allen Hamilton has been a prominent partner from the beginning. Richard Wilhelm attended the ceremony as a representative. I'm especially pleased to participate in uh, CGI University's uh, Day of Service. CGIU is creating opportunities for all of you to build relationships, learn from others, and identify new and more effective ways to get things done. And Booz Allen is proud to be part of that experience. Hundreds of Booz Allen employees, alongside volunteers from many other organizations, will pick up their hammers, where you lay them down, and continue improving these same homes. Thanks very much today for giving us a head start. For me, this day is clear evidence of uh, what strong partnerships can lead to. And I can't uh, really wait to see the results of today. Former President Clinton expressed the importance of helping locally and globally. It's important to remember that whether you're here or in a remote village in Africa or East Asia or Latin America or in a desert village in the Middle East, it's all the same thing if you start with people first. Because when people are disempowered in any way, it shows up in ways that you never imagined in the lives of the children. Any of you who come from a country where people have been disempowered know that there are children whose lives are kept back because of it. There are a lot of wonderful people who live here. They need and deserve the work you're going to do today. And therefore, this is a perfect place for us to demonstrate that at CGIU, we don't just talk, we do.